Hi everyone, I hope you're all having an amazing day. For today's macro video, I have compiled a selection of images that I took with the Canon R7 and the EF 100mm macro lens that I had attached via the EF2 EOS R mount adapter. I also added the Nisi 49mm 9 diopter close-up lens, which essentially doubled the magnification ratio to about 2x. If you're interested, I have an in-depth review of this close-up lens and I also compared it to the well-known Raynox DCR 250. So if you want to check out those videos, you will find all the relevant links in the description. Anyway, I'm going to show you what we captured with this setup and I will also briefly talk about each subject like I always do. Our first subject that was taken at the maximum magnification is a blowfly that was really skittish and I only managed to grab a single frame. The depth of field is very shallow as you can see, only about half of its compound eyes are in focus. Did you know that the blue butterfly that belongs to the same genus is used in forensic science? These flies help determine the time of both colonization and post-mortem interval, which refers to the time that has elapsed since an individual's death. A next series of four images shows another fly species that belongs to the genus Drosophila. These small fruit flies are quite widespread in the world and currently they have 800 described species. The day I captured these specimens, I spotted several more on rotting figs on the ground in our backyard. I found a really interesting fact about these flies. Apparently, males of this genus are known to have the longest sperm cells of any studied organism on Earth, including one species, the Drosophila bifurca, that has sperm cells that are 58mm long. The cells mostly consist of a long thread-like tail and are delivered to the females in tangled coils. It's also important to note that these flies have furthered genetic research like no other in history because the relationship between human and fruit fly genes is very close. Human and fruit fly genes are so similar that disease producing genes in humans can actually be linked to those in flies. The fly has approximately 15,500 genes on its four chromosomes, whereas humans have about 22,000 genes among their 23 chromosomes, while the density of genes per chromosome in Drosophila is higher than the human genome, the low and manageable number of chromosomes make this species significantly easier to study. Our next subject is a tiny cobweb spider that I stumbled upon in our garden as well. This first specimen was hiding on the underside of a succulent leaf and the subsequent images show another one that I spotted on our Swiss cheese plant. That was very small as well, not much bigger than a few millimeters. The family of this spider is huge with 3000 described species and for example the medically important widow spiders that are one of the model organisms that are used extensively for clinical research are part of this family as well. These spiders often build tangle space webs, hence their common name. Many trap ants and other ground dwelling insects using elastic sticky silk trap lines leading to the soil surface. This last image was further edited in Luminar Neo, where I used some awesome AI powered sharpening tools to make the textural intricate details of those tiny hairs pop even more. The following image is a formicin ant that I captured in our garden too. Apparently, these ants have gone through a very moderate evolutionary development since they first appeared on our planet. They don't really sting, but have large venom reservoirs, and their unique venom gland produces formic acid as a form of defense against potential predators. This amazing spider that you can see here is a leaf curling spider that is a quite common spider species in Australia, primarily in the eastern and southern parts of the country. I took this single frame while it was quite windy, and also the specimen retreated further back into its shelter when I got this close. These species form pairs living together in the same leaf, but they each occupy opposite ends of their shelter. They only leave the leaf when a prey is stuck in the web, or if the web needs some repair. They are very timid, and their bite is harmless to humans. These next two photos are most likely of a parasitoid wasp that I spotted once again on our Swiss cheese plant. What was really interesting is that if you look closely, you can see that something was attached to its abdomen. Apparently, the entire genital capsule was extruded, and this is an example of forestry. Small animals with low mobility often seek out vehicles to migrate to new environments for further development or reproduction and use the bodies of other organisms for transportation, and this is termed forestry. 
Anyway, if you're an expert and have an idea about the exact species, please let me know in the comments below. I left my favorite subject for last. This beautiful jumping spider belongs to the genus Survey and contains eight described species in Australia. This was the very first time I took pictures of this particular species. It was extremely inquisitive and moved around quite a bit. I spent about half an hour tracking it while it was traversing our Swiss cheese plant, moving from decaying leaves onto stems, while it kept looking around and posing for the camera from time to time as well. I really liked the last few shots, with the vibrant green color serving as a great backdrop for this gorgeous little spider. If you want to learn about jumping spiders in general, I have a video for you with heaps of interesting scientific facts, so feel free to check that out as well. I will leave a link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and you are new to my channel, don't forget to subscribe. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll get back to you. I'll try to help you if I can. You might also want to have a look at these videos next. Thanks again and catch you very soon in the next one.